Beginning in 1953, Soviet intelligence services undertook a special project to bathe the U.S. Embassy in Moscow with microwave radiation. A number of microwave emitters had been placed in nearby buildings and subjected the embassy to a low-power microwave transmission in the gigahertz range. This covert attack became known by U.S. intelligence agencies shortly after, who dubbed this event the Moscow Signal. At the time, intelligence agencies were at a loss over what this apparent attack represented. Believing it might have been an attempt at psychotronic warfare or mind control via electromagnetic radiation, U.S. security officials grew concerned at the Soviets' potential to develop mind control capabilities. This assumption was informed by Russian language research being translated by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, which demonstrated a high-level interest in the neurological effects of microwave radiation in Soviet research efforts. By 1965, several key staff at the Moscow Embassy were aware of the ongoing microwave attacks. Still, this awareness was kept secret from the rest of the staff, as well as the Soviets, who had continued broadcasting the signal for over a decade. A special commission had been formed, codenamed TUMS, headed by the State Department and executed by DARPA. TUMS would designate the U.S. Embassy in Moscow as a scientific laboratory to study the effects of microwave radiation on human consciousness and perception. Eventually, U.S. intelligence services declared mind control was not the intent of the Moscow signal, instead being used for jamming, triggering listening devices, or perhaps to negatively impact the health of embassy staff. Although the claims to health effects were never systematically proven, many of the embassy workers in this time would fall victim to cancer, and some would experience bizarre symptoms such as bleeding from the eyes, but most of these claims were ultimately anecdotal and not officially recorded. Even 40 years later, data gathered from the TUMS program continues to be studied by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. In response to the Moscow signal incident, DARPA commissioned a new project, DARPA Program Plan 562, codenamed Pandora. Defense Department physicist Bruno Augenstein immediately saw this program as a potential risk for the intelligence community. He sent a top-secret memo to several Pentagon officials hearkening back to the blunders of MKUltra in the 1950s, a secret program to experiment with LSD and mind control with disastrous consequences. MKUltra had become a national scandal and unnecessarily cost human lives and public trust. Augenstein was right to be worried. By 1969, Pandora had been ongoing for over five years with millions of dollars of investment. Pandora Project lead Sam Sharp, who enthusiastically conducted the first tests of low-intensity microwave weapons on monkeys, was not well regarded in his practices and lacked accountability. After one of the lead researchers left the program, new eyes were invited to scrutinize work done so far and assess the project's future. After the new review corroborated the already voiced concerns over flawed experimentation methods, DARPA's highest leadership would become involved. Increasingly concerned with the state of the project, Deputy Director of DARPA, Sam Lukasik, sought the counsel of former DARPA official Sam Koslov on research material produced to that point. Two years later, Pandora lead researcher Richard Cesaro would be fired from DARPA for general dishonesty. Others in the project would also meet controversial fates. The Moscow Signal and Project Pandora created another problem for public perception of how the government was conducting their research. Clearly, the Pentagon knew more about non-ionizing radiation than they let on, and people were now aware of this due to the way Pandora was executed. While a public opinion crisis on the scale of MKUltra had been avoided, the lack of regard for the lives and health of U.S. citizens displayed by some inside the Pentagon pointed out the sometimes malevolent interests displayed by these personnel. Nobody would have been overly concerned at the Pentagon experimenting with microwave radiation, but the reality that this program had been almost exclusively aimed towards military application under Cesaro's direction was a hard pill to swallow. The program had not even established a baseline study from which to compare their findings before exposing monkeys and humans to microwave attacks. 
While Pandora undoubtedly proved to be a waste of resources, this was a problem with research management and did not mean experimentation with non-ionizing radiation on human minds would stop. The newly discovered microwave auditory effect showed great promise, allowing low-energy pulsed microwaves to transmit sound directly to a target without using sound waves. In 1996, the United States Air Force filed U.S. Patent 647021-4B1, Method and Device for Implementing the Radio Frequency Hearing Effect. This technology has come to be known as V2K, standing for Voice to Skull, because the hard skull acts as a focusing target for microwave radiation, akin to the diagram of a microphone. The patent in question describes a fairly simple electronic device using radio waves to cause thermal acoustic effects in the bone and tissues of the inner ear, provoking an auditory experience on the target. The mechanism this patent functioned on, known as the radio frequency hearing effect, was known since the 1940s when it was noticed military radar operators would sometimes hear auditory clicks and tones even when no sounds were audible in their operating booths. The patent states that, Although pulsed carrier modulation can induce a subjective sensation for simple tones, it severely distorts the complex waveforms of speech, as has been confirmed experimentally. A message can be recognized as speech when a listener is pre-advised that speech is being sent. However, if the listener does not know the content of the message, the audio signal is unintelligible. So we have a claim that microwave or radio transmission of complex tones such as those needed for speech is not practical. This conclusion is seemingly at odds with the documented history of these systems. 21 years before, in the March 1975 issue of the Journal of the American Psychological Association, an announcement is made consisting of findings over the previous year concerning microwave beaming of speech to a human target. By radiating themselves with these voice-modulated microwaves, Sharp and Grove were readily able to hear, identify, and distinguish among the nine words. In this experiment, 10 words were transmitted, and it's claimed 90% of them could be understood on average. This report says the voice heard by the subjects was akin to the sounds produced by an artificial larynx. Further, it does explain that complex phrases and words were avoided, since they required higher energy densities and risked excessive heating of the skull and brain. In contrary to claims made in the 1996 patent, it seems simple phrases can be beamed to a recipient on microwave energy without much effort. This is based on older publications as well as more recent events. We should not assume these technologies are in their infancy, even though official claims would suggest they are. As is the case with cutting-edge military technology, what the public sees or hears is 20 to 30 years out of date. The biggest problem inherent to this technology is related to transmission media and energy density. Experiments with ultrasound, radio, microwave, and pulsed lasers all deal with the problem of containing enough energy to transmit complex tones while not damaging the target. While we may or may not have achieved the ability to transmit complex phrases, it goes without saying these technologies are viable as lethal or less than lethal weapons. The ability to project extremely high-intensity radiation allows for rapid heating of material and personnel at distance, and in extreme cases, vaporization of soft organic targets at closer range. Microwave weapons have historically included such programs as Medusa, an application of microwave voice-to-skull technology. The original Medusa system evolved into the Active Denial System, or ADS. ADS does not use voice to skull, instead simply heating the skin and irritating nerves. While official reporting has never confirmed the use of these weapons in combat, military service members have claimed their use in the Gulf War of 1990 by U.S. coalition forces. Similar allegations have surfaced in another more recent U.S. conflict, the war in Afghanistan. Again, soldiers are saying these weapons were used as psychological weapons and for crowd control. Official sources continue to largely avoid confirmation or denial of these allegations, but military journals and unofficial reporting has cited use in combat. There is no doubt these weapon systems are being deployed by both US military, private, and police organizations. 
The question remains whether the voice-to-skull capability has ever manifested in these applications. Even though they are associated with projects like Pandora, the weapons used by US forces in recent conflicts are different. LRAD uses a focused acoustic beam to point sound at individual targets, allowing verbal messages to be sent. Anyone else in the path of the beam will also hear the message, however. At worst, the LRAD causes discomfort and temporary deafness. The more potent ADS uses radar waves to inflict burning sensation on targets at range. History shows that mind control and psychic weapons have been taken as very serious threats by government organizations. Intelligence agencies in the United States took notice of programs by adversaries such as the USSR and more recently China. In 2021, US officials accused China of making strides in bioweapon development and also mind control weapons. This activity sparked sanctions against several Chinese firms allegedly involved in these technologies. Reports claim of a capability well in advance of the US-originated Voice of God systems, capabilities including being able to control the actions and thoughts of a target. What kind of technology could be leveraged to deliver on this claim of high-level control over individual thought and behavior? And what is the special sauce allowing these weapons to surpass the legacy of voice-to-skull tech used by the United States? Hypnosis systems are particularly of interest. Most mammals have a range of hypnotic effects they experience as a result of simple visual or auditory stimuli. Humans are vulnerable to involuntary hypnosis, especially under certain conditions. Exhaustion, stress, and fear make humans more vulnerable to hypnotic attack but these are typically intended to confuse and disorient rather than control the actions of the victim. While we do not know how these alleged Chinese mind control weapons work, we can infer from the claims being made that some kind of hypnotic effect is being used. A hypnotic message can be transmitted to a target using the mechanisms of American military ADS or LRAD systems. Hypnosis can be achieved reliably using sound stimuli only, so the mechanisms for these so-called mind control weapons is theoretically understood. However, hypnosis in humans is not easy to invoke against an aware target, and traditional hypnosis is unsuitable as an offensive weapon. Other effects are needed to attain the advertised mind control capabilities we are being informed of. We know from US development records that the greatest issue with all of these systems is their tendency to excessively heat a target when transmitting complex messages at an audible volume. The intention is not to build a death ray, so concessions must be made to avoid damaging the target. In order to increase the target's reception to a suggestive signal, contents of the transmission would likely consist of a stereo carrier signal with a slight variance in signal frequency between the right and left signal. This would need to consider the orientation of the target's head relative to the signal source. This can be achieved by modulating the frequency of the signal to within a known range. In application, the range of these frequencies would be fairly narrow. If the orientation of the target's head is not known, the signal sweeps all potential frequencies rapidly. The exact method for sweeping this range while maintaining an audible message would be an essential part of configuring the transmission and thus the software controlling this weapon. Consider this example. The target's closest ear on the right side of their head is subjected to frequency F. The brain's right hemisphere becomes focused on this tone, which is very similar to the brain's natural frequency. A destructive interference wave collapses frequency F into F' prime at intervals reliant on the frequency range and distance to target. Frequency F' prime is interpreted by the brain's left hemisphere. Dissonance between F and F' prime caused the brain to enter a state of hemisphere synchronization, and reception to hypnotic messages increases greatly. Hemisphere synchronization, or hemisync, is experienced when a person's left and right brain are presented with a slightly varied tone. You might be wondering, how effective is hemisync? Is it really possible to use this phenomena to control consciousness? Valid questions with a clear answer. 
In 2002, a study was published in Anesthesia, testing hemisync as a replacement for surgical anesthetic. The double-blind randomized trials concluded hemisync was as effective as fentanyl as an anesthetic. One potential drawback of this technique is that if the target looks directly at the signal source, they will not experience a large difference in frequency across the left and right hemispheres of the brain. We've already discussed how software can be used to mitigate this issue, but solutions to the problem also include operating the weapons in arrays with separation between amplifiers. Modern battlefield management, as is employed by major militaries, makes these systems effective in a variety of situations, since it's possible to bring several of these weapons to bear on a target quickly and with laser accuracy. The target may not immediately be aware they are subject to a hypnotic attack, instead experiencing a response ranging from a sudden inability to focus to confusion and disorientation. The verbal contents of the hypnotic message are designed to provoke this response by simulating the target's own inner voice. This kind of attack blurs the lines of personal identity, making it easier to implant thoughts and cause confusion. The most contentious point we have not yet fully resolved is how these weapons cause true mind control, like we imagine when we think of the Manchurian Candidate and men who stare at goats. We're Jedi, Bob. We don't fight with guns, we fight with our minds. What do you mean? If it is possible to control the actions of individuals at a distance on the battlefield, the rules of modern war will need to be rewritten. How realistic is this level of control over individual actions? In daily life, it's logical to assume the entry of a far and unfamiliar inner voice to one's thoughts would cause alarm and confusion. These are military weapons for use against troops, however, whose psychological performance is differentiated from those outside of the stressors of combat. Soldiers on the modern battlefield frequently rely on psychological contingencies to survive. Foremost of these is a trust of gut feelings, an inexplicable sensation compelling action. Superstition is a word not lost on the modern soldier, often bordering on the superstitious. A single person can never be aware of everything in their environment as much as their survival depends on it, so they purposefully rely on instinctual thoughts to compel action. A single thought passing through the mind of a soldier can be enough to motivate a reaction. Causing a soldier to doubt their own instincts is a fearsome weapon. On a modern battlefield, this technology grants an unprecedented edge. The benefit of weapons using the microwave auditory effect are clear. The system can be quickly and precisely directed at individual or group targets, it poses little to no risk to friendlies, and avoids damage to environment and property. The non-lethal performance of these systems at low power makes them appealing for military police and private use. Currently, no weapon in US active inventory takes advantage of the microwave auditory effect, instead relying on simple thermal effects to cause discomfort. Microwave weapons have disadvantages, something we can observe given the fact these systems have been deployed in multiple theaters of war and never formally used in combat. Microwave weapons need line of sight to function, so any kind of atmospheric effects, such as rain or fog, can limit the weapon's effectiveness. Modern munitions and military vehicles are often equipped to detect incoming lasers, radar, and other signals used by targeting systems. Microwaves can be detected and then targeted by counterfire, making usage in a traditional conflict unlikely outside of specific situations. How we define mind control is important in this discussion, but official sources have shied away from making any distinction. Does China or the United States currently have secret weapons in their inventories capable of complex mind control? The answer appears to be yes but neither nation would publicize possessing such a weapon unless they were already being used. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's topic and our treatment of it. Our release schedule has gotten a little bit slow lately, and I apologize for that, but we're working to get back on top with things. I've got about a dozen scripts or so that need to be produced, so it's just a matter of time before we get uh, more continuation to our ongoing series and also some new material. 
So thank you everyone, and uh, we'll see you in the next video.